Welcome back to Shared Practices. This is season four on case acceptance. And we have with us another rock star from Voices of Dentistry. Today, we interviewed Rachel Wall. She is a hygienist who's also a speaker, who's also a consultant, who's also written a book. All amazing material. Completely all of the stuff that George and I love in terms of a hygienist who just gets this empowerment mindset of of setting the patient up for treatment. She has literally written the book on this. And our conversation today, because we've talked so much this season about how, how powerful it is to empower hygiene, how much easier it is when your hygienist is having these conversations with the patient before you even walk in the door, I, I didn't want this interview to be an overlap of kind of the stuff that we've already talked about from early on in this season, which a lot of her presentation was, you know, she, she said it even better than we've said it. But I wanted to go a step further on the implementation of this and how to balance this with other priorities in hygiene. So I really, really liked where this conversation went, really enjoyed this interview with Rachel Wall. So here we go. Maybe you've thought about switching to Blue Sky Bio's implants, but you're not sure because you haven't had the chance to try them out in person and see for yourself. So I'm, I'm the type that when I'm on Amazon, when I'm on anything, I'm gonna look at the reviews. I'm gonna read the reviews, the good reviews, the bad reviews. I wanna know exactly what I'm getting myself into. So I went on the 365 Digital Dentistry Facebook page and found a post of someone who said that they were finally looking to switch to Blue Sky Bio's implants. And someone asked on that thread, what makes one want to use Blue Sky Bio's implants over other clone or compatible systems? And what do they offer that larger name brand implants don't offer? I love the responses here. This was awesome. One of the first responses was, better implants, better people, cost savings. Another one said, easy ordering, cheaper, cross compatibility, innovation in the DIY CAD guided realm. Wade Pilling said, in my opinion, better service, better pricing, better cutting edge technology, better implant design, better platform design, and a model that is kinder to general dentists. And then Baron Grutter said, my reason for liking the Blue Sky Bio Max line over Nobel, number one was cost, $99 to $135 for the implant. Number two, 30% stronger platform design. He's never seen one of the Blue Sky Bio implants flower or split during placement, whereas some of the narrow platforms of other brands have done that in the past. Number three, universal platform with a much better inventory, so a lot better options. Number four, Dr. Sheldon and, and Albert, who are experienced clinicians who will help with nothing in return. So fantastic support at Blue Sky Bio. Number five, ease of ordering. And number six, no rep pressure. And he said, these reasons are not necessarily listed in order of importance, but in order of most significant difference. So you can see that these people who have been placing these implants, they love the, the cost, they love the convenience. In many cases, they believe they're actually a superior implant. To try out your first set of Blue Sky Bio implants, go to blueskybio.com slash store and check out their six lines of cutting edge dental implants and compatible parts. I have with me today, Rachel Wall, RDH, who is founder of Inspired Hygiene. Kind of cool as well. There's a connection with Paul, who we interviewed earlier today. And basically, you are now known, and he was bragging to me that he knew you very early on, but now you're you're a big deal. You've been oh, thanks. going around to that, but... <laughs> many, many conferences and helping many people, many offices improve their hygiene department. Mm -hmm. And I was eating up your lecture earlier today because you were talking about empowering a hygiene team. And we've talked about that on the show before. We've basically seen that there's so much room for improvement. There's so much room for growth. And a lot of people are stuck in the mindset of like, this is what hygiene does. Mm -hmm. Then the doctor comes in and diagnoses. Right. And instead, the more empowering you can do, the more, the more that you can basically um, pre-diagnose, maybe yeah. pre-treatment plan yep. and, and set yourself up for success. So I don't want to steal your thunder, which I'm doing. <laughs> let, me, let, let me let you talk. We're talking about case acceptance. How can hygiene be central to case acceptance? I want to hear your perspective and the way that you talk about it. Well, I think, I mean, you did 
kind of just brief it. I just stole your thunder. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. You briefed it, so we'll, we'll dig into a little bit more detail. But yeah, the hygienists are perfectly capable and should be empowered to, like you said, preheat the diagnosis. Yeah. And and what we teach, what I spoke at here at Voices of Dentistry was really the dentist giving that hygienist permission to do that. Yeah. And sharing how far do you want the hygienist to take the patients down that diagnostic path? Mm -hmm. Do you want them to just, you know, educate the patient on what the problem is, take the intro photos and show them, you know, what, what's happening, or do you want them to take it a little further and also share with them the possible solutions to that problem? Yeah. So that when you come in to do the hygiene exam, I mean, the, the worst case scenario is you're stepping in and we see this all the time and the hygienist just doesn't say anything. Yeah. And you kind of have to say, so what do you know about Ms. Jones today? You know, well, her daughter got married. <laughs> okay, well, what else do we know? <laughs> you know, so it really should be the hygienist leading that hygiene exam. Yeah. And that, but that takes some time. It's not an automatic thing, right? It takes some effort in the dentist communicating to the hygienist. Okay, here's how I'd like to receive the information and what I'd like to receive. Right. You know, is there anything that I really need to know about the medical history? Patient have any complaints or concerns? You know, what, what are things that you discover during the diagnostic part of your exam? What have you talked about? It's great to let the dentist know what is the patient's response to what you've talked about. Okay. Because if the patient says, yeah, we need to do that, then the dentist really doesn't need to go in and kind of try to, try to re-enroll the treatment yeah. or reinvent it or resell it or re-educate. And a lot of times that happens and hygienists get really frustrated with that because it takes a lot of time and they feel like, gosh, the dentist is saying I what just I just said, said all this. but the dentist probably doesn't know you just said all that. Right. So we have to say, Hey, I just discussed this tooth number 14 and that you would likely recommend a crown to really strengthen that tooth. Cause it has this old filling in here and a lot of cracks. So we talked about what a crown is and what that's going to do for the tooth long term. Cool. You know, what would happen maybe if she doesn't do the crown. So then, you know, you don't have to go through all that again. Right. And also letting the dentist know, you know, so if she says, you know, she's ready to do that. Good. All you need to do is say, awesome. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing you and that's taking care of that. Yeah. When can we get it started? Do you, do you recommend this conversation happen in front of the patient, in the yes. hallway? How, how would you recommend people handle that? Yes. Always in front of the patient. Okay. I really, uh, my philosophy, our philosophy at Inspired Hygiene, we have a team of coaches that are really doing amazing things with practices is really the only things that should be said you know, in the hall or, you know, in the lab or something like that about the patient if, is if it's something that's really sensitive. Okay. You know, somebody had someone in their family that passed away sure. and they've got a really kind of sensitive issue that you want to kind of discuss first. Yes. Yeah, so you don't figure like out how you're going to approach it. all happy yeah. and weird. And, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's us. Yeah. Are you doing fantastic today? Right. Well, actually, you know, right. my dog just died. So unless it's something that's really sensitive, have those conversations with the patient. It's about them. Yeah. And it, what it does is it helps the patient know that you're communicating, right? They, they kind of know if, you know, if you walk in, they're like, so Rachel tells me that blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, what else uh, did you, you tell me? That's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. You've been talking about <laughs> me in this back room here. Well, and, and on the flip side, so either, so you do it in the hallway and then they, they come in and like, oh, okay. <laughs> or, or you don't do it and you walk in and repeat yourself and you're like, you guys obviously don't talk. So the patient, if they're hearing the exact same spiel from you that they heard from the hygienist, then that doesn't look good either. So how do you phrase it, though, when you come in and you're talking about the patient mm -hmm. in front of the patient? What, mm -hmm. what, how do you like, start that conversation? Mm -hmm. So it's good to have keywords. Yeah. So maybe when the dentist sits down, right, he might, you know, have a little chit chat with the patient, build a relationship there and say, so Rachel. Tell me what you guys have talked about. Tell me what you've discussed. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell the dentist what I talked with Ms. Jones about. It is going to be a little repeat, but there's nothing wrong with the that patient hearing it again. Right. Well, and, and it's, it's one thing to hear it if the hygienist comes in and says something, and then the dentist comes in and he says the exact same thing, but the patient knows they've already heard this and they're giving them the shame spiel and they're going in the same depth. It's different than like, the patient hearing themselves talked about, like, I, I feel like that feels different. That repetition of like, that validates, I've heard you, I understand you, mm -hmm. and now I'm communicating it to my dog. Exactly. So that he understands too. And it's really great if you can do that where both the dentist and the hygienist are in visually in front of the patient. Okay. 
because it, I, I use the cocktail party analogy, right? Like if, if someone's standing behind you, they could be saying really great things to somebody else about you. But if you hear it, you're kind of like, mm, this is kind of mm, weird. It um, feels weird. Yeah. And I'm not part of that conversation. Right. But if you're in front of them, even just for a moment in that initial part, then you're having a three-way conversation. Right. Now, the other piece that's important is if the patient isn't ready to move forward, and if they say, well, I don't know about that. You know, last time I had a crown, it really hurt or whatever. Then you can say to the dentist, you know, and Ms. Jones actually has a couple questions. She's got some concerns. Sure. You know, she had a crown in the past. that wasn't, wasn't very comfortable. So maybe you could talk to her a little bit about that. So now that's when the dentist knows, okay, I need to settle in. Yeah. And I need to really listen yep. and ask some questions. Now, the, the hygienist certainly can do that. But sometimes the patient needs a little more reinforcement and just understanding Right. From the dentist. So it's just nice for the dentist to know where am I going with this? Right. How much detail do I need to give? And then here's the nice byproduct of that is that I have heard from dentists and I would think if I were a dentist, this would be my experience is I'm going to be a lot more likely and willing to get up to do a hygiene exam if I know that it's going to be like boom, 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 lay down, very laid out, succinct. Because if I'm in the middle of a procedure and I just know oh, I'm going to have to go in there and I'm going to have to start the whole conversation from scratch, yeah. then you're probably going to wait longer for the exam. And honestly, a lot of times dentists just get exhausted. Yeah. The burnout. Of that. They get burnout on it. They get resent. They start to get resentful of hygiene exams and mm -hmm. look at it as an interruption instead of an opportunity. And then and then the hygienist is a little resentful because they can sense that resentment, yeah, and that, that resistance totally. to come doing it. And they're like, I'm trying to help you, but I'm trying to do your cleanings and everything. But I know. And You're the patient feels up. all that. Yeah. And also sometimes what will happen is the dentist will just be like, "You're fine. We'll check you next time." Even if there are issues. Issues. I mean, you know, obviously if there's something that's really glaring, they would address it, sure. but you know, just things that can be proactively handled sometimes just get tired. Yeah. No, and that's that's a fantastic point because that fatigue, that mental emotional mm -hmm. fatigue, fatigue affects your case acceptance. It affects the amount that you're diagnosing, the amount you're, you're presenting and, and the success of the practice. So there, there's two things I want to talk about. And I don't know which one we should start with, but let's start with, we're talking about the hygienist taking a front seat of, of co-diagnosing and working towards the, the treatment plan that the patient needs for all of their restorative needs. So let's stick with that for a minute. How do you get, how do you calibrate mm -hmm. each other? How do you mm -hmm. get on the same page mm -hmm. so that they're seeing what you're seeing, they're recommending what you'd recommend? How can you do that as a team exercise? So we recommend that you do that as a team exercise. We call it case review. It's okay. It's pretty simple. It's a fancy name. Yeah, I know. Very fancy, very creative <laughs> name. So you just set up some time, whether it's in your monthly team meeting, you know, if you're starting with a, a new team or if you feel like this is just something you really need to refine with yeah. your existing team then you might want to do it every week okay. and bring the case, bring, you know, pull up the patient, look at the medical history first, look at perio, look at radiographs, look at photographs, but don't look at the treatment plan if you can help it. Okay. And then have the team create a treatment plan. Now, obviously you're going to need that. You wouldn't do this on day one that you show up in the practice. Right. Right. Because then it's kind of like a test. Oh, yeah. How good are you? No, a lot of pressure there. Right. Uncomfortable so, pressure. So perhaps what you do is you start out with, you know, maybe, maybe just saying, Hey, what do you guys think about this? Yeah. Like, you know, what, what have you recommended in the past? If yeah. you're brand new, you know, so you get an idea of kind of what the treatment philosophy has been. Right. And you kind of keep it low key. And then as you build a relationship with your team, then you can kind of, you can work into something that's more complex. So I always say, start with simple cases. Okay. Right. Start with obvious things. Right. You know, maybe an old mol a molar that's just got an old crappy, you know, filling in it. Right. And know you're going to do a crown on there. So just start with things that are pretty obvious and then work to more complex. The other thing that Paul Etchison talks about is psychological safety. Mm. So you want to make an environment that is psychologically safe mm -hmm. where you say, hey, look, guys, there are no dumb questions. We are all here to learn. I'm going to learn from you. You'll learn from me. And the whole effort is for us to get calibrated because I really am going to depend on you guys. And I have confidence in you that you can do this. And you know, you're just important as important in the diagnosis as I am. Yeah. And I really need your help. Yeah. That's a big load for the dentist to try to carry all by themselves. Yeah. Is being the, the one to make all these, you know, treatment recommendations every day, all day for every patient. Like you need your team to help you. 
other thing that I have found that helps a lot is to for the dentist immediately, when you're listening to this, start today, take prep photos. Mm. So when you take out that old crusty amalgam, take a picture. What does it look like before you do anything? You know, and then so once you've taken you taken out the amalgam, but not the decay. Yeah. So leave it in there so everybody can see that because you and the assistant see that. Yeah. We never see that. Right. Your business team never sees that. Or or if like, you know, it's like a, is this a watch or a, a do on a interproximal decay? And, you know, you, you actually end up doing it and then you show your team, hey, this is actually what was down there, you yeah. know, and maybe some people would say, watch this, yeah. but look what was look in there. At, right, exactly. And then after you, after you take out the decay, you know, if there are cracks or if there's anything in there, take another picture mm. because we also don't realize often how big, how extensive, yeah, how extensive the yeah. prep has to be, yeah. how much tooth is lost. And they're like, wow. And you actually put a buildup and then a crown and then that's tooth is going to last for 20 more years. We're like, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that's, that's why we're doing this. Right. So that's really, really helpful when you're trying to illustrate your treatment philosophy. You know, show some failures. Okay. You know, if you've got a, you did an MOD on a premolar mm -hmm. and it cracked in half, mm -hmm. take pictures of that. Yeah. You know, I remember Dennis doing that and saying, this is why I don't do MODs on premolars anymore. Right. Because this happens and it cracked all the way down to the root. And the patient lost the tooth. I, I've had a premolar that spontaneously cracked on itself. It's just like. Yeah. So put an MOD in it. Now. We're now going you got to a town. wedge. Yeah. And, right. It's not going to last long. So. It's, yeah. Th this is fantastic. This is a, a great team exercise that you can do. It's going to require some photography. Mm -hmm. It's going to require a little bit of planning to bring that to your team meeting. And then for everyone to kind of write. And you give them all the facts. Let them say. What, what do you think would be best here? Yeah. And, and we're all going to learn. We're going to calibrate. This is a safe space. There's no right answer. You yep. don't get a candy bar if you get the right answer. Right. You know, this is just, we're all learning from each other. Yeah. How often do you feel like people need to do this? So say that they want to start really implementing this. Is this three-month process? Is this a forever process? Is this like, you know, you do this once a week or once a month? What, how could someone do this? I think you could start by doing it once a week, even if you do one case. Like maybe you say, hey, on on Thursdays, we're going to come in 15 minutes earlier yeah. and we're going to do one case. And then, you know, if you have a monthly team meeting, you, you maybe spend 30 minutes on it at the team meeting. And then you just kind of see how it goes and it might go really well and everybody's doing really well with it on the basic cases. And then you might say, okay, now we're going to step it up. We're going to start talking about more advanced cases. Yeah. You know, maybe you do it with sleep apnea and you just look at the patient like, so here's what I saw. You know, you have a picture of the patient. Yeah. And then I started asking this patient these questions. Right. And they started saying this, and that's what made me think this. So then you're really teaching them like high level thinking and decision making. Right. And that's way more fun than just running through a schedule full of propies all day long. Right. The other thing about it, you said, yes, it's going to take some time in photography, but we should be doing the photography anyway. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you need that for, you know, documentation, you need it for reimbursement, you need that photography. Right. And and for your websites, yeah. your case acceptance, for right. everything. Because you can now show the inside of that tooth to another patient. Yep. They don't know whose tooth that is. Right. Say this, so your tooth looks, looks like, like this. this. And, and look what happened. Tooth. Here's their tooth. Right. This is what was inside. And after we clean everything up, this is what it looked like. Right. I love this. This is this is a great way to get everyone on the same page. And I it also makes me think of if you're gonna try and introduce a new procedure in your practice, you wouldn't maybe think, maybe I should bring my hygienist to totally. this class about sleep apnea or really about the whole team, the, honestly. Yeah. And, and the way that you schedule things yeah. and do all that. But I think it helps when people realize that my team is going to be the one presenting this and helping the patients understand the benefits of this mm -hmm. and really prepping me up so that we actually do this procedure after we go to the course, then taking the whole team makes a whole lot more sense. And, and actually you can, you can be like, we're, we're coming here and you guys need to learn how to present this. I need, that's right. your job here is to yeah. learn all of this so that you're on board with me and that you can help me carry this. And so rather than going yourself and then coming back and trying to like calibrate download everyone it and download it all. Yeah. It never is the same. I remember Howard Varan always says, you know, the most successful dentists are the ones that show up with, you know, 10 team members. Yeah. They bring everybody. It's expensive. It is. It's expensive. But think about how many cases are you going to sell if you're the only one that's driving this. Right. Versus if you've got everybody on your team driving it. Right. No, absolutely. Exponentially more. Yeah. Right. And 
if it, and, and I talked about this in my courses, you know, you come back and you say, Hey guys, we got this great new service and this is going to, you know, we're going to be able to offer this and nobody else in our area is doing it. We're going to do this many cases, it's going to increase production, blah, 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 blah. And all they're just hearing is like, wah, wah, wah. They have to hear, they, they have to believe in that service right. before they can effectively and consistently enroll it. Yeah. And they'll believe it when they go to the course and hear, all right, well, this is how this is actually saving people's lives. Right. So you thought you were doing this kind of care for patients, but really you have the opportunity to do this. And, and maybe they'll, a big deal. the fire will be lit yeah. in them even more exactly. than it is in you. Like, exactly. Because now they're like, I can save people's lives every single day. Yep. Like I'm, I, you know, this isn't just tooth health care. This is health care. Yeah. And that's, you bring up a really good point because as dentists, you know, you have to hold yourself accountable too to what you're going to say, but give your permission, your team permission to do that. Yeah. So, you know, the dentists, we sh they should be holding their team accountable, but give your team permission to hold you accountable. Mm. So uh, I love that you say that because ironically, that's what my co-host George has seen that since he empowered his hygienist to really talk about treatment, he now knows they're going to bring all this up. And even if I am tired and not feeling it today, yes. they've already talked to the patient about this. So and I, I can't, I like, can't just back it. out and yeah. just like, ah, well, you're fine. You don't yeah, need right. that. It's keeping my diagnosis consistent. Yes. Even if I have, I sense resistance from the patients, even if I'm, I'm not in a great spot, you know, all the, I'm assuming they can't pay for it. Even right, if all these right. factors, now I'm going to present what needs to be presented every time. And back the hygienist up when they've presented it. So yeah. then, so then they're not frustrated with you. If you, if you told them, Hey, I want you to present everything. And then you like, don't follow through on your side. It's not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have, that comes out sometimes because we do these case reviews with our clients to kind of show them how to do it and yeah. run it. And that comes up often is, you know, maybe, maybe on the side, the hygienist said, well, you know, like sometimes I'm presenting implants and the doctor comes in and unsells it. Yeah. So how do I handle that? So it, when you have a facilitator there, they can say, so that, you know, we can ask some questions like, okay, so doc, like what, what would cause you to maybe back down from this treatment plan or what and holds the, you back sometimes? The calibration, you know, you're going to calibrate up and you're going to calibrate back. Yeah. And, and as long as everyone sees that, like not as a failure, but as a learning curve, right. then, and then has conversations about that. You've not only empowered them to do this, we've also empowered them to bring that up and yeah. say, Hey, I really was excited about implants for this patient. And then you kind of backed off. I just want to understand what made you back off. So that next time I don't like, overdo it. I had that exact experience with a doctor that I used to work with is I had a, the patient all teed up for crown buildup, crown lengthening. Wow. Like what else can you do to it yeah. too? Right. Pretty much everything. And I had the picture up there and everything. And then he came in and he said, you know what? Actually, I think the better long-term solution would be just to remove the tooth and do an implant. Now this has been <laughs> probably nine years ago. Yeah. Okay. When this was all just kind of beginning in general dentistry. And so I said, okay. And he did it in a very respectful way, which is key. Yeah. Because a lot of times if we do it in a condescending way, right. the hygienist will shut down oh, yeah. and you've lost You're it. You're done. Yeah. So I went to him because we had a good, open, safe relationship. I said, so tell me about this. He said, you know what? I've just, I've been going to a lot of CE about implants. I've been talking to my community, my network of dentists. Yeah. And I just don't think it makes sense for the patient to spend that much money on that tooth it's that is not a good risk. It's compromise. Yeah, it's not a good risk. Yeah. And when I start to see decay that's creeping down towards a vacation, yeah. the best option is just to remove Move it on. and do an implant. Move yeah. on and do an implant. So is it okay? That's great. The rest of the team needs to hear this because yeah. you've changed your philosophy. Right. It's updated. Right. You've updated your philosophy. Exactly. And so we need to support you on that. And it was great. So we did and we moved on. That's, that's a great example of how that could have blown up if he had been dismissive or you hadn't brought it up or it just kind of like creeped. And then over time, then you just feel less sure and less mm -hmm. excited about things. Yeah. And so you're, well, I'll stop pretending. Yeah. I am so proud that we still have Q Optics as a sponsor for the Shared Practices podcast. It's been almost two years and I'm still using my four and a half X prism loops. They're custom through the lens. They're beautiful. People like them. I get compliments on them. But more than anything, I love the magnification. Some people are hesitant to jump up from two and a half to three and a half, maybe to four or even 4.5. I have never met someone who said, 
you know what? I really wish I could see less when I'm doing dentistry. I really just like, if there's decay still there, I don't want to know. I just want to close this tooth up. You should want to see as much as possible. It's going to make your preps better. It's going to make your life better. You're going to see more. You're going to catch more. The only person I can give a pass to, we had someone buy some loops and share them on our Facebook page. And I was like, oh no, why didn't you get the prisms? Why didn't you get the three and a half, four and a half? He's like, well, I'm a pediatric dentist. I was like, fine, okay, you get a pass. You can buy normal Q-Optics loops. Everyone else, you should be buying three and a half plus. You're not gonna regret it. So if you're finally ready to upgrade, email sales at qoptics.com and use the promo code SP19 as in shared practices SP, SP19 for a discount off your loops and light combo. Where else do teams struggle with this? Where else have you seen that like you come in, you, the doc's on board, the team's on board, and then implementation or even just getting people on board? Where, where do people struggle to get on board? So both those questions, where do, where do teams struggle to get on board with this? And then if they are on board, where do they struggle to implement this? this co-diagnosis and this case case study calibration? Yeah, sometimes if you're in a practice that has multiple doctors, okay, they're really eager to get the team to support, but they haven't calibrated themselves. Okay. So the dentists need to do this exercise first. Right. And get calibrated. Now, they don't have to be, you know, the Stepford Wives of Dentistry, <laughs> but you need to have generally the same philosophy. Right. Because if you have a hygienist and they have multiple doctors treatment planning on the same day, it's really hard to keep it all straight. Yeah. Keep yeah. it all straight and say, well, this doctor's going to treatment plan this way. And this one is really hard. Yeah. It's exhausting. And, and it's great that you say that you need to kind of calibrate as doctors. And also when you're hiring, if, if say that you're an owner doc or you're looking for a partner or kind of calibrating in the interview and, and whether you should work sure. together is, should also be something that maybe comes up because mm-hmm. if you're vastly different, mm-hmm. no amount of calibration is going to like, bring you in line with each other. Yeah, that's that, very true. It becomes a hard practice to live in. It does. So that's a great point. It does. So yeah, maybe you could do some kind of, you know, case review exercise during the interview yeah. or no, bring, me some, bring me some of the cases that you've done. And some of the borderline stuff or maybe some of the stuff that, you know, could go either way or stuff that you're really passionate about yeah. you, is very tightly held yes. for you. See what their philosophies are those on those and how tightly held those, yep. those philosophies are. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that's, useful for me for the future and yes. kind of like hiring and yes. interviewing people. So then you said how to what are the other obstacles? I mean, I think I think the the normal obstacles that we think of when okay, everybody's on board and the hygienists are, you know, teeing up treatment for the doctor, you know, you guys interviewed Sandy Purdue. Yeah. And you know, what she said was that I think she calls it the wrap up. So instead of the doctor leaving and they're like, "Okay, so, you know, when was your when, when's your cruise? When you told me you're going on a cruise, like wrap up what you discussed. Yeah, reinforce. Reinforce, wrap up, and then make sure when you're handing off to the business team that they know what was discussed and why this is being recommended. So do that same handoff that you did from hygienist to doctor. Then the doctor leaves, the hygienist reinforces consequences of no treatment, yep. walks the patient up, and yep. then kind of does that same explanation. Yeah, to the, it could, yeah. It doesn't have to be, be the whole thing, but exactly. yeah. Exactly. Could be a brief, you know... Ms. Jones, we've recommended a crown on 14 because that tooth has a really old filling and there's cracks and we just don't want it to crack down the root. Yeah. Could be that, you know? And she's ready to go ahead and find a time for a doctor to do that. Right. Or, you know, she wants to make sure and look at, you know, what can her insurance contribute? What is her portion going to be? Right. And I told her you can help her work all that out. So, you know, I think always financial is always an obstacle. Right. Right. Because we all have our own kind of biases and beliefs about that kind of thing that we transfer to our patients. Yeah. So one of the things around that is I say, you know, a lot of times the business team might have options for the patient. That the clinical team doesn't know about. Right. Or isn't well versed in or comfortable talking. Yeah. about. And that's OK. But sometimes they literally don't even know. Sure. Oh, we do, we do that. We'll do three months in office. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know we would do that. I mean, I've seen that happen multiple times. Yeah. And the the business team is like, how did you not know? Well, they just, you know, they're the just dentist, doing their thing. Right. Doing, just doing thing. your thing. And the dentist probably had a conversation. Maybe, maybe the office manager came up and said, hey, what do you think about us starting to try to offer this to the patients? And he said, well, sure. But then it never like got any further. Right. So have not some, get some calibration on that too. Yeah. Like, what do we do for our patients? How? 
you know, I remember this one practice that we worked with. They had this gal that was fabulous. And she just said, look, I will get creative. I will do, you know, we'll put part of it on care credit. We'll put part of it on their credit card. They can pay cash. We're going to do whatever it takes to make it work when the patient wants the treatment. So that's nice because then you can kind of just kind of like, okay, I can, I can present best, best treatment and she's going to handle it. That's awesome. So what about when people just don't buy in? How often does that happen where you have team members, a team member, a hygienist who just like you tell them, I really want you to talk to patients about what you're seeing. I really want you to maybe even make some recommendations or, or kind of guess what we're going to talk about Mm -hmm. and say, this is what's possible. And maybe Mm -hmm. this is what the doc's going to say. And someone just doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. How often do you encounter that? I don't, I feel like anytime you have a consultant coming in, there's some level of skepticism. Yeah. There's some level of skepticism or reluctance or just like, hmm, yeah, skepticism is a good word. And so we try to get that out on the table right away. Okay. And because if we're going in to help them with their hygiene department, which is what we do, right. then we have a, a pre, you know, visit call. Okay. And just say, hey, you know, what are you excited about? Because the hygienists have things they're frustrated about too that they'd like to see change. Right. And we do some surveying so they have a chance to express that. Kind of bent that a yeah. little bit. And then we, you know, what are you excited about working on? And what are you maybe a little nervous about? Yeah. Well, I'm afraid you're going to make us like present treat, you know, diagnose perio on every single patient. It's going to be too aggressive and that kind of thing. Yeah. So then we just talk about it and we, you know, put their, put their mind at ease. Okay. And then they're typically way more open. Cool. The other thing that we do is we kind of pre-teach them. So before the coach ever comes in. We actually have a webinar series that we recommend the whole team watch. Okay. And it kind of, it, it preheats the team for what we're going to be presenting when we go in office. Right. So when the coach shows up, it's not the first time that they've met them. You know, they may have met them on Zoom, you know, like right. a virtual meet. It's not the first time they've heard, you know, the verbal skills. Right. It's not the first time they've heard how to do a complete period chart. Like they've heard this. So they have some time to kind of take hold of it maybe try out some of the verbal skills, kind of test it out, discuss it amongst the team. They also have a chance to see how serious the dentist is about implementing it. And so the dentist can say, look, guys, like we got to do this. Yeah, This is what our patients need. Our practice is at risk if we're not documenting this. And so we have to do this. And that's why we're hiring these folks is to come in and help us figure out how to make this work. Yeah. So it's rare that there's not a small amount of resistance, but I would say 90% of the time people get on board. That's cool. So I like that system for, because if you're coming in cold, you're kind of doing the same thing with the team that you do with the patient. Where right. with the patient, you know, you kind of like the, you're putting the bug in their ear and, mm-hmm. and you're talking about what yeah. you're seeing, you're co-diagnosing before the doc even gets there. Same thing with the team. You're, you're exposing them to like, these are the ideas we're doing. Yes. Uh, we're also making sure they feel very heard just like with a patient, you want to ask what they care about and what they're concerned with and, and then listen. And then you can interpret that and translate that to the doctor and they can feel very heard. Mm-hmm. So doing all of those things beforehand sounds like it's increased your guys' kind of acceptance yeah. of change and yeah. transformation within a practice. Yeah. So you're right. Because what happens if, you know, the hygienist doesn't say anything to the patient for 45 or 50 minutes and then all, because all of a sudden the dentist comes and just drops the bomb on the patient. Right. Well, nobody likes that. It's uncomfortable. It's very for uncomfortable for everyone. So the same thing would be true if all of a sudden we just show up one day. And yeah. It's like, hey, I'm here to completely change your hygiene department. Right. Which is not what we typically do, right? We want to refine what they're already doing. Right. So that same concept could be applied to, you know, having the team, the clinical team tee up treatment more. Right. You could start with, hey, you know, I would just like for you guys to start taking photos, photos. of every patient. Yeah. And then the next, and and have them up on the screen when I come in. And then the next step is, okay, so now we've got all these photos and we've gotten comfortable with that. Share what you're seeing on those photos with the patient. Right. Just highlight the problem, right? And do that for a couple months. Right. Then say, all right, so now you've gotten comfortable with that. The next step is we're going to really work on calibrating our treatment plans. Right. And maybe you've been doing that kind of all along the way. So now I'd like for you to start sharing with them what the possible solutions are. And if you don't know, say, you know what, it could be this or this. Right. And really there's never, it's never a bad thing to do that. Right. Because you're likely going to pick one. Right. Well, and, and we, we talked about beforehand saying, you know, what, what 
what George Bias is his practice to be is maybe give them a worst case scenario. Totally. Start with that. So we yeah. can go backwards from there. And if it exactly. is the wor- worst case scenario, they were prepared for it, you know? That's exactly what we teach is kind of tr- treatment plan a little bit over, you know, if you think, eh, you might be able to do a DO on here. Right. Although it might be pretty big, you know, instead you're going to, you're going to prep the patient for, you know, an inlay or you're going to prep them for a crown, whatever the doctor's sure. treatment philosophy is. Sure. And in that way, you can always back down. Now, it, you know, we're not talking about crazy, you know, they need a small occlusal and you're no, going to do a, no, you know, no, yeah. crown. But if there's any question. Yeah, borderline things. Then treatment plan up. Yep. Because then the do- doctor can always come down if necessary. And right. he or she is the hero. Yeah. No, I, I'm totally on board with yeah. that. Let me take a look here. Okay, so. I now have kind of this this crisis or thought now because I can I I love this concept of pre diagnosis co diagnosis of really empowering the team that is driving the treatment plans and the production of the whole practice. Mm-hmm. However, there's also a separate like almost practice within a practice, which is the preventive yeah. services that hygienists can offer mm-hmm. of fluoride and sealants mm-hmm. and a really healthy perio program mm-hmm. and like you just said, I really liked how you kind of broke that down like month by month. You're kind of implementing each step. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you could do it all, you know? Yeah. And, and, and be the hygienist who is great at presenting and getting acceptance on those preventive services and having time to do those preventive mm-hmm. services in the chair and be also the one who's taking photos and talking about the treatment plan for the doc and, and teeing that up too. I, I, yeah. It, because then that's where the hygienist is like, okay, I can't do, can't everything, do everything in the same, hey. this amount of time. Yeah. Like, I'm throwing up the white flag, right? Yeah. So I think what you have to develop or what I found I had to develop was a skill for triaging. Okay. And really kind of figuring out, what, questioning the patient. You know, I do my diagnostic piece. So the first, tw- we say the first 20 minutes of that 60 minute hygiene exam should be diagnostics. Okay. Right. Whether that is radiographs, oral cancer screening, perio charting, you know, doing a, you know, survey of the restorations in the teeth. Like, what am I seeing, you know, for restorative yeah. and just talking to the patient, what are their concerns? So once I do that, then I can usually, if I've spent time getting calibrated with the dentist, yeah. I can usually figure out what's the most important thing for us to address today. Mm. Like the one or two things. Mm-hmm. So if they have decay that needs to be addressed, then I probably can also talk about fluoride too. Okay. Because that's something that I'm doing. Sure. But what we don't want to do, and I talked with Paul, Paul Etchison on his podcast, he talked about this a lot, is allow all the little things to become so much of what we discuss that we don't talk about this big glaring thing. Right. You know, like this tooth that's about to fall apart. Right. And the dentist comes in and and the hygienist is really excited because the patient's accepted, you know, fluoride and sealants and electric toothbrush and all this stuff. And the dentist is thinking, oh my gosh, that's great. But you've got a bomb that's about to go off. Yeah. Now that's an extreme example, but it happens. And sometimes it happens with something a little bit more subtle. Sure. There's nuance to it. There is nuance to it. So I think you have to also get calibrated on what are the priorities. Yeah. So some dentists say, you know what? I don't want to do crowns if they've got perio disease. Right. We got to get the foundation healthy first. And so unless there's an imminent emergency, you got to you got to make sure they're healthy first. Right. So if you see that, that's the route you're going to go, knowing that when they come back in on that first, you know, therapy appointment and or the evaluation appointment, we've got to start talking about restorative. Mm. Right. So we got to start planting that seed to keep that ball rolling. So I think you it's philosophy. Yeah. So you have to ask the dentist specifically, like, what do you you know, when do you want them to recommend? restorative over perio because right. there are times when that's more important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, I remember having a patient who had four and five millimeter pockets. She was young. They were bleeding. She had bone loss. She had four or five teeth that were decayed to the gum line. Right. Well, you got to get that taken care of first. Yep. So part of it's back to the philosophy and that's a good thing to do in case review. Right. Is what takes priority. And then the other thing is being able to look at the patient as a whole and not get so wrapped up in my, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get a bonus if I do five fluorides today. Right. And that, that is kind of the downside yeah. of procedure driven incentives. Right. It's, it's when their bonus based on their production versus 
the practice is production. Yeah. And there could be a combination of the hybrid, two. Sure. Mm -hmm. There could be a hybrid of the two. But particularly, I think when it's, you know, one particular procedure, and if I get a certain number of these, I'm going to get X. Sometimes it can just, you know, be blinders instead of looking at the whole big picture. Well, and let me, so let me kind of put this framework that I'm trying to develop in my mind to, to test here. If you're a type of practice that does a lot of big cases mm -hmm. and has a lot of patients with a lot of needs, mm -hmm. then maybe I would bias towards focusing on the hygienist role in the co-diagnosis and pre-diagnosis as the focus. You can still also be aware and, and working on the other things. If the practice, maybe the practice has a really healthy patient base, they're younger, they're families, and or or it's just a very bread and butter type practice mm -hmm. that isn't doing a lot of complex care, mm -hmm. then maybe you are focusing more on the preventive services. And that's kind of the the one of the main drivers of the hygiene department. With with still and, and, and some variance on either end. Some variance I don't on know. I don't know that I agree with that, Richard, because Good. here's this, the counter. I love it when people push back. <laughs> this is perfect. Here's the counter is if you have a pa patients with a lot of complex needs, do you want to put a lot of complex dentistry on a bacterial toilet? No. no. And, 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 <laughs> and when I'm, if you're talking about perio, absolutely. Yeah. Perio has to be taken care of if you're going to be doing anything on top of anything. Uh huh. And by the way, I might add, it might not be a bad idea. This is very controversial, but it might not be a bad idea when you're getting ready to put implants in a patient to do a salivary bacterial test, yeah. which is an adjunct, right, sure. for hygiene. But that could be, I think that's something that the hygienist could do as a pre, you know, as pre-work to the big case. Right. You know, before they, you know, before maybe and after they do a perio case on someone that's going to have five or six implants. They're also doing a bacterial test to make sure that we're getting those bacteria levels down. And, you know, it's, it's you, I kind of work myself back into, yeah, but we need to offer them everything. But you can't. Right. Because it overwhelms the provider and overwhelms the patient. Right. So I see what you're saying is, yeah, maybe we get, we look at the, what are the big problems and perio may be one of those. Right. And address those things. And then once we get them stabilized, now let's figure out how do you avoid getting back into that position again? Right. Yeah. That makes total sense. Well, and, and, I still think that your patient base matters too. If you've got, say you're in Sun City West here in Arizona, which is 55 plus, your focus on perio versus fluoride and, and well, and, and fluoride can still be for everyone because they're taking medications. Now they got dry mouth right. and all that, but versus sealants. You know? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's got to make sense for the patient. It can't be just for the sake of doing that procedure. Right, yeah. so, so that's where I'm saying if there's, if you have, say you have four hygienists because you have such like a large healthy patient base, your focus on fluoride and sealants and, and perio might be a little bit more than like taking a whole series of photos on every single one of those patients that, you know, like with the DSLR mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I guess it's a, it's a balance and... and I think you're going to, I think it's going to be, I mean, unless you have, and, le and there, you know, at this, at this conference, there are dentists that they're their primary focus in their practice is implants. Right. So unless you have a very clear focus in a general practice, you're going to run into all of that. Yep. Right? Yep. So it's going to be a blend all the time. So I think that it is, is that, that case review on a case, on a case by case basis is saying, okay, now here's, here's some learning for us here is this young patient came in and her chief concern was she doesn't like her smile. And the reason she doesn't like her smile is because she's got, you know, number six is busted. You know, number eight is dark because right. she had an old, she has a dead tooth. And we took a PA and there's an abscess on six. And she's got some four millimeter bleeding pockets with some bone loss. And the hygienist spent 30 minutes trying to convince the patient that she needed perio. Mm -hmm. So that is an obvious opportunity right. to turn it around and say, look, We've got to address, she's had imminent emergency. She really wants us to fix her smile. She doesn't have advanced periodontal disease. Right. So can we get her down that path and give her what she's asking for and say, yeah, you've got some gum infection too, and we're going to get to that real quick. Yep. And, and if you want aesthetic cosmetic stuff, kind of holding what they want, 
as like, this is where we're going. Let's make sure you're stable, you know, take care of the emergent needs, address the chief complaint. But if they have like a cosmetic goal, then say, okay, now we're, we're going to have to get your, here's part of your, here's part of the cosmetic solution. I love that yeah. we're having this debate because what this is saying is, is that if you're going to empower your team, they're becoming healthcare providers with you. Exactly. And, and your, your team meetings are turning into like a middle, little mini residency of, yeah. of that's right. Here's X, Y, and Z. What do we do? Mm-hmm. And and sometimes, you know, especially at first when there's a lot of learning on simple things, mm-hmm. the questions are kind of easy. And it's really getting people on board. And then once you start getting in the weeds, now now the the skill set that you're building on top of that is how do we stay focused on what's most important? Mm-hmm. How do we decide what's most important? Critical thinking. Yeah. And and how do we realize that for every yes we're asking the patient to to say they can't say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. And so let's focus on, let's learn how to focus. Yes. So it, it's, it's a set of skills that builds upon itself. Yeah. And can never be forgotten because then once you get everyone all trained up, then someone Some new lose, situa- yeah. or you lose a team member yeah. and you hire someone else. Yeah. And now you got to re kind of keep right. everyone on board. Yeah. So what you could do, you know, to kind of mimic what we do with our webinar series is you could record some of those sessions, sure. have somebody edit it down and then say, okay, so here's my, you know, like, like my, yeah, here's my philosophy. Like my dentist said, you know, when I start to see that decay approach the frication, you know, it's, it's out and an implant in. Yeah. So when you can maybe have someone edit the video and distill it down, yeah. then so all like of a sudden now you can have like thing. a training thing yeah, yeah. Totally. to at least bring them up to the basic level and then sit down with them and say, so what were your thoughts on all that? You know, what did you get out of that? Do you feel comfortable with this? Right. And man, that's a whole lot more interesting than, again, than just doing probies all day long. Yeah. It just, that gets boring it's fast. Just really, it's just really cool to realize that like you're providing healthcare as a team. Yeah. And you're, you're critically thinking as a team mm-hmm. and, and, and having to make hard decisions as a team, but all with the end goal of providing the patient the best, getting them to a state of health and also being a successful practice while you're at it. Yep. So this, this was a lot of fun. I think. We got some real specifics in terms of implementation and how to layer this skill set mm-hmm. where people might get a little resistance and how they can prevent that. If just like when you when you're doing this with a patient, you got to prep them. Yeah. And, and that's this whole process. You got to yeah. do the same thing with your team, yeah. making sure that they feel heard and all of that. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really great insight mm-hmm. that uh, we haven't had on the show before. Oh, so if people to want to learn more about you yep. and what you do and your resources and how you can help them, you've got a book as well. So tell us about the book and how they can reach out to you. So our website is inspiredhygiene.com. The easiest way to get the book, you can get the book on our website and our store. We're getting ready to redo our website. So we'll see what it looks like in a couple months. But you can also get our book at rohbook.com. That's return on hygiene. Return on hygiene. Yeah. And it's kind of a hygiene benchmark Bible. So it really lays out what are some of the KPIs that you want to look at for the hygiene department. Awesome. And then when you find one, maybe that you're not tracking where you want to be, what are some key things you can do to to see some movement on that? Yeah. And then, yeah, always, always also you can reach out to me at Rachel, R-I-C-H-E-L at inspiredhygiene.com. And, you know, we're always happy to, me and the team are always happy to chat with anybody about how we might be able to help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thank Rachel. You. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Thanks, Take care. Richard. We'll see ya. I, I hope you guys really enjoyed that interview. For me, I really was not expecting us to go in the direction of elevating your team to the point where you're all clinical providers. And I know that sounds so stupid. I mean, as the dentist, I should assume that like all of us are on the same page. But so often this, this like discussion of cases is something that dentists assume that only dentists do among themselves. That that's, that's for, you know, dental school or residency or CE. But why wouldn't you do that in your own team among, as all of you are healthcare professionals, so that your team understands and can calibrate and can speak and see the same things that you do? This really just elevated my view on what a dental team can be together. So I was very pleased and very happy to have this conversation with Rachel Wall. I just got her book in the mail. Got a lot going on. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but Return on Hygiene is the name. If you reach out to Rachel and tell her that you heard her on our podcast and that you're interested in her book, 
she'll set you up with that. So reach out to, to Rachel on her website. We'll put it in the show notes here. Another administrative note from an episode a few weeks ago that we had Kira Dent on and we announced her new podcast. And being that audio and podcasts are such fickle friends and that we're hanging out with iTunes and Apple, iTunes, when you submit a podcast, it doesn't automatically get approved. And sometimes that timeline, you know, can be a few days. Sometimes it can be a few weeks. So her show right now is like stuck in iTunes limbo, which is extremely frustrating for her because she wanted to have this big launch and, and we interviewed that show and we talked about the dates. You know, we talked about Valentine's Day. We talked about Friday the next day and then it got stuck in, in iTunes limbo. So if anyone is excited about Kira Dent's show, I want you to reach out to her. Her Instagram account is Dental A Team. You can follow her on Facebook or even on our page on the Shared Practices page. But just say like, hey, we're totally patient. It's, it's totally worth the wait. We're just excited for your show. I'm sure she'd really appreciate the encouragement that, you know, we didn't waste the launch. And, and I just feel really bad for it because I'm super excited for the show and it's, it's coming out soon, any day now, but we don't know when and it's all up to iTunes. So go, go give her an encouraging word or a thumbs up or a follow on Instagram, whatever, whatever you want to do. But um, we'll let you know on the show as soon as it's actually out and we'll tell you to go download it again whenever that actually happens. So in the meantime, thank you all for anyone who came up to me at, at Midwinter. It was really cool to, to meet some people there who are listeners of the show. Just to, it's, it's amazing to go to Midwinter and realize like how small we are. You know, dentistry is so big, the industry is so big, and there's, there's so much out there. So it's it's humbling in in a good way. So I'll let you guys know next time. Uh, I think the the next meeting I'm going to be at is the Dental Success Institute or sorry Dental Success Summit here coming up in March. So anyone who's going to be there, reach out to me. We should definitely hook up and hang out at some point. We'll talk with you next week on the Shared Practices podcast. <laughs>